Well, good morning and welcome to the 19th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for 2018. May I ask everyone present to turn off or turn to silent any electrical devices. Um, we've received apologies from committee member Kezia Dugdale and also apologies from Dean Lockhart for this session. He'll be joining us later as well as a couple of other members who will be joining us shortly. Uh, item one is a decision by the committee to take items three, four, and five in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Now we turn to our inquiry on the impact of bank closures. And uh, first of all, before I go on to ask the committee members to introduce themselves, the uh, witnesses we have today, as I face the panel of witnesses from left to right, uh, first of all, Professor Cliff Beavers, um, who is the chairman of Juniper Green Community Council. Alistair McKillop, who is the chair of Curry Community Council. Then Paul Alexander, head of business development and sales strategy at the Scottish Building Society. Lynn Turner, regional officer of Unite Scotland. And finally, Keith Dryber, a policy manager at Citizens Advice Scotland. So I'd welcome uh, all of our witnesses today and then I'll ask um, committee members perhaps just to introduce themselves by name, uh, starting on my right. God MacDonald, MSP for Edinburgh Pentlands. Jeremy Johnson, MSP for the Highlands and Islands. Colin Beatty, MSP for Midlothian North and Musselburgh. Philton McGregor, MSP for Cobridge and Crayson. John Mason, MSP for Glasgow Shettleston. Um, Gordon Linters, committee member, MSP for Lothian. Andy Whiteman, MSP for Lothian. Thank you very much. Um, if I could start with the, a fairly general opening question, and I know that evidence has been submitted in writing to the committee, so perhaps we could just start off, um, and perhaps I could indicate to witnesses there's no need to operate the microphones. This will be operated by the sound desk, so no need to press any buttons. And if you want to come in <clears throat> in answer or response to questions, don't feel you need to answer every question, but if you could indicate you'd like to come in simply by raising your hand, then I'll try and bring you in uh, as, as we can. Now, um, if there are any areas that you don't feel you've been able to cover today or provide full detail because we have limited time in this session, then please do so in writing following the session. That option is, is available to all of our witnesses here today. So if I could start uh, just by asking perhaps for the, the headline in terms of who you think are most affected by bank closures and if witnesses would like to come in on that. Who would like to start? Lynn Turner. Um, Chair, I, w I would say that both communities and employees uh, are affected by the decision of RBS. Um, if I can just touch on um, the employees at the moment, you know, they've had this is the fifth round of branch closures since I've been uh, an officer of RBS, and clearly this last announcement on the uh, 1st of December, which is uh, now for 52, which inevitably will be 62 branch closures, um, has a, had a detrimental effect on not only, empl only employees, but also the communities that it serves and has been there for a number of years. Um, Alistair McKillop and then Professor Beavers. Thank you, Gordon. Um, personally, my, my focus really is on those people living with dementia and the elderly and, the, and those living with isolation. And whilst I fully accept that the, the, the foot traffic in, in branches has reduced dramatically, for those who are left, it is a hugely important asset for the community and for, for those people in particular uh, because they aren't able to travel. For example, if we take an example of Curry, it's two buses that they would have to get to get to their nearest branch. And it's totally unacceptable, I feel, for, for banks to, to just dispose of what are very long-serving customers of, of the banks. I mean, uh, I've been speaking to ladies and gentlemen who have been 30-odd years plus with uh, the Bank of Scotland and the Royal Bank of Scotland. And I think it's very, very short-sighted that they're almost throwing the baby out with the bathwater rather than look for other avenues, for example, of, of 
smaller branches or part-time branches or, or using them in conjunction with something else, they have just decided to just to close them and to leave the the communities that they served with with very very few amenities. I mean, we have lost the the, the banks, we have lost, we are possibly going to lose our school. Uh, there's there's very little left, and I think, uh, bearing in mind that the Royal Bank, especially, who are partly still partly owned by by our, ourselves, uh, and they're making a substantial profits of one over a billion pounds really have to look at themselves and decide who do they serve i mean i understand that their are, are companies looking for profit but i think they also have to look at serving the communities that they have done for many many years thank you gordon thank you and professor beavers Th thank you gordon P perhaps one point of accuracy i was the chair of juniper green and babbitt mains community council but i'm now an ordinary member of that committee apologies um, it's obviously the elderly, the disabled in our communities that are most affected. A uh, number of disabilities have problems going online. Uh, my own problem with uh, having to use a screen reader, but that's not the only problem. There are people who can't remember the long list of numbers that they have to have in order to access a bank account online or by telephone. So the issues there are in our communities and as Alistair has said, it's difficult for them also to get on a bus or two buses to get into town uh, to, to go to their uh, 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 allotted bank. But there's a big impact on our communities as well through the business community. Um, the fishmonger in Juniper Green tells me that since RBS closed, he's down 15 to 20% on his takings. He checked with a colleague near Golden Acre where two banks have closed and apparently he's down 20 to 25% on takings. Now, these small uh, retailers and shopkeepers in our communities are the lifeblood of the community because let me give you an example of two or three weeks ago when the snow came suddenly. It was the fishmonger, the butcher and the greengrocer in our communities that kept people with food when the big beasts of uh, commerce had their lorries stuck on the motorways of Scotland. So they're not only important to keep the trade, but they also keep the social fabric uh, of a community together. There, you'll be asking for a research at some stage. Um, there is a piece of research from UK uh, government in December 2016, which indicates when a bank leaves an area, 63% of investment is lost in that community. Um, Juniper Green, Curry, Collington, Bab uh, Balerno represent something like 20,000 people. So when RBS closed uh, last year, it was like the last bank in town leaving that community. There are now no banks on the A70. Uh, a, a main artery into uh, uh, Edinburgh and 1.6 million it is estimated is lost every year in investment to the community when the last bank in town leaves so that is a big problem thank you and Paul Alexander and then Keith Dryborough um, for our um, perspective well from our perspective our members are serviced um, throughout Scotland with five branches and a network of local agents. Now, these local agents are generally solicitors' offices. And what happens is our members can pay in money into their savings accounts. They can take money out of their savings accounts through these agents. Now, they need to have a link to a local bank to pay in their cash, to pay in the, the checks they take in, and at times to top up their cash floats. So the issue we've got for serving our members, particularly in the rural areas, is that if we see the closure of uh, that banking connection, it's very difficult for us to maintain the agents' offices and, and how they can deal with the savings transactions. Now, we can do it through a local post office, but as we know, some of the post offices can be parts of um, retail shops, 
There's security elements around somebody um, taking cash or a large amount of cheques to pay into a post office um, where they're not protected in the same way from fraud and, and also um, you know, other uh, threats as well. So there's an impact to our members, certainly, if banks were closing, particularly in the rural areas. Uh, Citizens Advice Bureau um, advise about 210,000 consumers each year across Scotland. Uh, we consulted with the Bureau there in the areas that are going to be worst affected uh, by the bank closures or who have already been affected. Uh, and what was clear from what they were saying is it's the, the people that are most vulnerable to change are the ones that are going to be affected. So the people that are more likely to have um, problems accessing digital services, have poor broadband speeds, those in rural Scotland. Uh, we did some work that showed about 20% of consumers still aren't online, and we, we have concerns that there are a lot of people that are, are being pushed towards the online banking that either are unable to uh, uh, take that up or um, have physical barriers to doing so. Uh, we also found that older people are, protect, are particularly affected. Um, we had a look at public transports. Uh, we did work a couple of years ago looking at access to banks through public transport. We found that people living in rural areas uh, typically had to travel about 40 minute round trip to their bank using buses. Uh, I think that's going to increase significantly as um, as uh, bank, the bank closures uh, take place. Uh, and lastly, just to echo the points in businesses, actually Citizens Advice Bureau raised that small businesses are going to be really badly affected in terms of getting change, depositing cash. And that applies equally actually to charities and community groups that rely on you know small amounts of cash, depositing subs and things like that. Um, and since the Vice Bureau themselves are saying there's a, there's a security risk for them that's adding a lot of pressure to volunteers. So there's an impact right across vulnerable consumers, businesses and you know, charities and community groups. Thank you. We'll now come to questions from Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Thanks for coming this morning. Um, Obviously, the branch has been closing for some time now. Lynn, you were mentioning previous closure programmes. Um, and concern has led to um, the development of the access to banking standard, which requires advance notice, and public impact assessments, um, making customers aware of alternative solutions. Um, in any uh, bank closures that you're involved with, are you aware of th this exercise having been carried out? C can I just say the round before this one, um, I looked at the Whitman branch closure in West Lothian. And if you had a look at the impact assessment done there, clearly that's not an impact assessment. Um, and we raised that, in fact, at the Scottish Affairs Select Committee because, you know, it, it's numbers on, 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 on a website, but it doesn't tell you anything with regards to the, the impact on that branch closures, vulnerable customers, all that kind of stuff. So we, we dispute the impact assessment done by RBS, and we've been clear about that from day one. All the impact assessments? Uh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a fudge. Other, bra other banks? Um, I'm not too sure of what other banks have done, because solely I'm, I'm concentrating on RBS, but the RBS impact assessment on branch closures, uh, uh, you know, clearly that is not a clear impact assessment. And I'm sure that will be echoed by... Uh, Yeah, just to um, reflect uh, on the Bank of Scotland, Gordon MacDonald and myself, amongst others, visited the Bank of Scotland uh, when they were deciding to close our branch in Curry, and the impact analysis there was an absolute disgrace. It was a tick box exercise. It was purely 100% one-sided. Uh, they, all they really were looking at was footfall. They actually admitted to us that the the customers in Curry were actually first rate brilliant customers, which is what they didn't want because basically they can't make money off of us because they've already got mortgages, they don't want insurance. There, there is a substantial amount of savings, but again, they weren't interested in that. And the, the risk assessment, as you quite rightly said, in the Bank of Scotland certainly did not make any uh, co consideration to those who are living in isolation or loneliness. Basically, they said, well, there's going to be the internet access, go on with it. Bearing in mind that in rural areas like ourselves in Curry and Balerno, the uh, broadband is internally quite slow and often uh, prone to breakdown, uh, and it's, it's it's an argument that really is uh, is a non-argument, in my opinion. Keith Dryborough. Uh What worries me most about the, the business assessments and the access to bank uh, to banking standards is that there's no power consult consultation with community groups or. 
uh, indeed consumers or customers. Um, so making an impact assessment without really asking what the impact is going to be on, on actual people. Um, so it's very much a, a business-led uh, assessment. Uh, and I think uh, going forward, you actually need to consult with the community about what the alternatives are, what the impact is going to be before you can t make that assessment or make a decision. Um, Professor Beavers and then Lynn Turner. One call call me Cliff Gordon, please. <laughs> I'll, I'll do that, Cliff. Thank you very much. Um, the uh, access to banking protocol was something that we picked up fairly early on when RBS decided to close in Juniper Green. When we looked at that document, it was clear that the only thing that you could hold them to account on was the um, Equality Act. And even then, it was easy for them to dance around the fact that they weren't going to cover uh, issues of disability for people in, in our community. The access to banking protocol is worthless. It's just a piece of paper that allows the banks to pretend that they are consulting with communities. In my experience, there was no consultation whatsoever. It was a, an exercise that was um, decided in the headquarters and the group that came to talk to the community was simply told, you're closing the branch and you're taking the ATM as well. And that's also a big issue for us in Juniper Green because we have no post office nor any ATM. Um, I think it's, it was clear, Chair, um, that on the evidence um, on the 17th of January that RBS gave to the Scottish Affairs Select Committee when it was um, the, the CEO for personal and business banking said, we don't have to co consult with communities. Yeah, uh, you know, I just thought that was ludicrous. And incidentally, he's been asked to appear in front of many um, public meetings in the borders and has refused to do that. Th thanks very much. When you say it's one-sided and focused on footfall, are you talking about footfall? I can't, sorry, I can't remember who said that. Is that focused on footfall in the bank? Yeah. So, so there's no assessment made of the impact on footfall in the general area of the loss of a... None whatsoever. All they're interested in, they, 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 they wax lyrically about, you know, 70% drop in footfall, only 80 people come during the day. So basically, it's all about money. It's not worth their while. They don't even consider the, the, of downsizing the branch or, or doing anything different. They just use that as, as a big stick to hit us with. They say, you're not using it, so you're going to lose it. And they, 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 that is their impact assessment. If we're, they're losing money, they're not interested in looking at any way of, of revising how the, the bank itself works or the branch works. They just say there's only very limited footfall, costing us money, we close it. That's it. And Cliff, Cliff Beavers, I think you mentioned anecdotal evidence of a fishmonger, I think it was? Yes, it was. In, in, in your community, 15% takings yeah, down. That's what he um, told me, yeah. Are, I mean, are, are you aware of, of studies that, that look less than a systematic? Way. The one I mentioned, uh, Andy, was the one that the UK government did, a briefing paper in December 2016, uh, as I say, when it was, it was an analysis of postcodes where the last bank in town had left. And there they found that, uh, and it was actually uh, in loan investment to SMEs, so it's actually only a tip of the iceberg because when people, when a bank leaves an area and people have to bank elsewhere, they take their shopping elsewhere too. And so money leaves the community, not only because they don't have the opportunity to get loans, but also because people are spending it elsewhere. Okay. One, one thing to confirm, by the way, from your previous hearing, uh, I did an informal check around our own retailers and they still say it's 70-30 cash v card. Mm -hmm. In, in communities, and I think that confirms what you heard at the last hearing. So just coming back to your to your fishmonger, 15% <laughs> down. This He's this a good man. Uh, this is this is local people yep. who are no longer buying fish in their shop because they're going somewhere else. Yep. They're going somewhere else, yeah. and they're going somewhere else. You're implying because they need to go somewhere else for banking, and therefore they might as well buy fish there too. Well, that that's and. Obviously, not a, a, a step I can take because yeah. all I can do is claim 
uh, tell you what he claims to me, mm -hmm. which is that since the bank closed, he's 15 to 20 percent down. And, and I, I said, is that true elsewhere? And he went and checked with another one of his colleagues, the, the one I mentioned at Golden Acre. Okay. Just, just to really to add to, to that, Andy, is that, uh, needless to say, I, I like, uh, like Cliff, I made a, a sort of pop quiz of, of, of our local businesses, and 70-30 was certainly the, what they felt was 70% cash. And uh, just the reason I was sort of agreeing with Cliff and more is that the, the, anecdotally, uh, one of the shopkeepers said that what happens is basically, the, because they used to pop into the bank, get some money, then spend it. Uh, what happens now is they have to go out of town. So rather than have the money then coming all the way back to Curry, they just buy the shop nearest that particular branch, which is there. So that's why the, they are concerned that, that they're losing they're losing the footfall traffic because people because they're in the bank anyway. Well, the shop's just across the road. I'll do it all in one. So that's really where the, I feel that the knock-on effect is. That's anecdotal, though. I mean, I, I can't. You know, there's sure. no proof of that. But that's just thanks. And John Mason. Thanks, convener. Um, I think aiming maybe at Mr. Turner for starters, although others might want to comment on this. I think Unite have made some quite strong uh, comments about all of this, which I think is helpful, I have to say, for the committee uh, to know what people are thinking. Specifically, I think I'm right in saying that you've said that RBS has misled the public on a number of counts, and these are particularly measurement of footfall, uh, scale of job losses and the costs or savings of the proposed closures. Would you like to comment on these three areas? So if we start with footfall, um, the information presented to me, is, let's take Malig for instance, it has nine customers, in fact it has 1,001 customers. The nine customers that RBS counted was nine customers who come into the branch on a weekly basis. So the evidence that was presented to me, it was no, RBS in Malig only have nine customers. That's why we're closing it. Not true at all. And not only so on, I would have thought footfall as a layperson meant like in a week, 99 people no, came into the branch. No, but it still has customers. So but if I go into the Malig branch and I'm a customer somewhere else, but I happen to be on holiday in Malig, I wouldn't count. No, because you're not a regular customer of these nine. So it was the, the figures w were massaged, or if even if you take the redundancy figures, which the bank presented as one six eight, in fact it was three two one, the bank's one six eight was full time equivalents. The actual headcount was three hundred and twenty one job losses, mm -hmm. because you know if you had two part time people, they were just being counted as one. Okay. Uh, and you know this is as I said earlier, this is the fifth round of branch closures that I've uh, taken um, on and. Uh, um, being with our um, officer for RBS, if you continue to reduce the branch network, people will go to the next RBS branch, and then people will go to the next RBS branch. People are actually queuing out the door now at lunch times mm -hmm. in RBS branches. Yes, yeah, so, I mean it was my and, sorry. sorry, and also they've not increased the staff in these branches that remain open. Yes. So you know staff aren't getting their lunch. They're, they're two-handed or sometimes three-handed. So you know it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a mixed message that RBS is is sending out there. Yes, yeah, so well, certainly my experience in Shettleston when they closed our branch, that uh, I used it and it was well used, and there was you always had to queue. When I my, was my experience, and then but it still was closed. So just getting this, I'm intrigued by this word footfall and what they mean by it, and what most of us would mean by it, because um, if it's only customers that they're measuring, are, are, do you think they're actually measuring how many people cross the door every week, no. or is that not even being no, it's, measured? It's, it's, it, oh, they're, they're counting people who are actually entering the bank on a weekly basis, doing money in, money out. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, they could have a city centre branch, say, with no actual customers for that branch, but that branch could still be very, very busy because loads of people who work in the city centre and have their branch elsewhere yeah. are actually using that branch, but yeah. they would end up saying that the footfall was nil. Yeah. Is that, is that right? Potentially, yeah. Because they're not regular customers to that particular branch. Yes. So, you know, it was, this was highlighted by uh, Ian Blackford in, in, in his uh, adjournment debate. You know, Malig is just not the only one that has it. Lock Elsh, I think there was yes. 3,000 customers. Uh, sorry, uh, 3,000 customers of, of the local RBS. Yes. Because many of us use, I mean, I live in Glasgow, but I'm in Edinburgh most of the week, so I use banks in Edinburgh as well, so but that's not I'm, your branch. I'm amazed or intrigued or whatever 
uh, that that's the way they measure footfall. Okay. Uh, the, the third one was the costs and savings. Can you say anything about that? Um, well, obviously, RBS have said that, that the 62 branches uh, would cost £9.5 million, which is, what, 0.01 per cent of their, 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 their profit that they announced there in, in February, March. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is a, this is a, um, a closure programme that did not have to happen. This is purely driven by profit mm -hmm. and, and RBS turning its back on local communities. Do you think there'll be a loss to RBS? Because although you suggested that people would just go to the next RBS branch, if I was living in Malig and if there was another bank there, I might be considering switching my bank. And um, RBS um, have said that, um, that they will actually openly take people to the post office. So if, you know, I, you know um, I laugh, but it's, it's, you know, it's not funny, you know, in respect of um, um, a branch colleague will take someone to the post office to show them how to use the post office. And, and the UK minister has also said, well, they can vote with their feet. So you're a 70% owned British taxpayer organisation. And the minister who is responsible for RBS under their brief says, yeah, well, they can vote. Customers can vote with their feet. OK, I think some of my colleagues will follow up in the post office because I think that's an area we're interested in as well. Uh, Mr Alexander, you're going to say something? Yes, we do find that where, uh, you know, branches such as RBS close, we do pick up a number of new savings members who will move savings to ourselves. So we do see that in the local, particularly the rural communities, such as Danoon, places like that. C can you just clarify for me then, you, you don't really operate like a bank in the sense, because I was a bit intrigued that you actually need either a bank or a post office nearby if you're that, going to operate. That's absolutely correct, yeah. We don't, we don't offer day-to-day uh, -day transactional banking. We are there solely for a haven for savings or for mortgage advice. Throughout Scotland, yeah, we don't do. But, but somebody could come in every day and take out ten pounds out of their savings account, or put in twenty, or something. They could, they could, yes. Most of our savers, most of our members, don't do that, but occasionally somebody could do that, yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Um, McKillop. Did you? Yeah. Uh, just, just very, very briefly, just um, uh, to give you an idea, when when uh, we had three banks, uh, Balerno, Curry, and Juniper Green. The Bank of Scotland was in the middle; it was two royal banks. When the Balerno Bank closed. All the customers trotted to Juniper Green. When Bank of Scotland closed, all the customers trotted to Juniper Green, which was absolutely full to the bust. But it's then they decided, well, we're going to close the Royal Bank of Scotland and Juniper Green as well. So there was no logic about footfall because they were they were getting three banks into one, and even so, and the cliff fought very very hard to, to retain the the, the, the branch, branch in Juniper Green. They were didn't care about that. They just wanted to close the banks. The banks end the story. So the, the really the justification about low footfall doesn't really stand up when you look at the statistics of the the two branches in Balerno and the Bank of Scotland uh, joining the Royal Bank and then suddenly being told six months later that they're going to close as well. So if it's nothing to do with footfall, I don't think it's anything. Is it to, do with to force people to stop using? local branches and to use online or something else Well, John, I'm, I'm very, very glad you used that word because you're absolutely correct. It is forced. People are being forced to go onto online, irrespective of their their, their their needs are going to be serviced by that. As I get, as I was talking about, uh, you know, those living with dementia, etc., and, and Cliff alluded to, these people, there is no way in the world these people would remember passwords, etc. So they're mm -hmm. going to be wide open to fraud and to all other sorts of uh, nasty experiences. But again, the banks are not really interested in that. They're ex I mean, when we, Gordon and I were sat in the Bank of Scotland, they basically said that as well. Well, you know, you'd let your feet do the walk. If you don't like what we're doing in the Bank of Scotland, go to another branch or go online. It's not as simple as that, but the, the, the banks are allowed to get away with that by, by saying, well, it is simple, as simple as that because there's, there's low footfall. And there's no real evidence of that. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just a, a cost-cutting exercise for cost-cutting's sake, I think. OK, I think Mr Beavers wants in next. Yeah, Cliff, please. <laughs> well, sometimes we use formal names here. Yeah, OK, OK. Uh, um, just to say, uh, we can't all be wrong. I know it's all anecdotal, but we all go into branches and the queues are out the door. And the queues were out of the door in Juniper Green when they closed it on the argument of footfall. That's number one. Number two, where is the geography in these people? I mean, this is the headquarters of RBS, and they, they didn't seem to know that the A70 would no longer have a bank along its stretch, and that's 20,000 people. It just seems strange that they didn't talk to one another as banks 
and say, well, can we not leave one in that area and another in this area? For example, I think there are six in Castolfin, yeah. none on the A70. Uh, can I ask, are they, are they allowed to talk to different banks and arrange that between well, themselves? Maybe they're not allowed. They, they hide behind the commercial confidentiality, I'm sure. Uh, but it would have been a sensible thing to do for the community and for the country to do. It would have been something that could have been arranged and worked through. I mean, they can go in, in a room together to work out what the um, eyeball <laughs> rate is. <laughs> so they could go into a room and sort this out, I'm sure. OK, thank you. It, was it Mr Dreiber or did you want to...? A couple of times it was mentioned about people, consumers voting with their, fight, their feet to, to show, um, you know, displeasure with something or, or to make sure that they, they still have, um, you know, face-to-face -face contact with their banks. Um, Scotland, as a, in general, are, we're more loyal as consumers. We tend to stick to the, the brands that we know, that we've had long-standing relationships with, that, that we trust, and we probably term it as sticky consumers, so we're less likely to trust, so we need to break that cycle a little bit and encourage people to vote with their feet if they want to have a, a local bank branch. Um, but unfortunately, it's not always an option. So there are too many closures where it's the last branch in town, so people don't have the option. Um, so it'd be great if people were voting with their feet, but we do have this problem with loyal consumers or overly loyal consumers and the problem that some people just don't have the option to vote with their feet too. Uh, and talking of feet, uh, is your um, understanding of the measurement of footfall the same as Mr Turner's? Um, I, I don't think we have statistics on that. I sent, certainly our Bureau, when we asked them, were concerned that these were busy uh, branches that they used and they didn't see the reasoning for it. Uh, we don't have figures on that, but our anecdotal evidence would suggest that as well. Thank you. And uh, a follow-up from Fulton McGregor. Thanks, Convener. I wanted to ask panels maybe for uh, Lynn Turner, um, but, but other members are, are free to come in as well. Um, do you think that RBS in this situation are exploiting the particular demographic likely to use the branches in terms of how they might protest. And the example I'd give by that is uh, the steps RBS in my own constituency is one due for closure. We had put out an online uh, petition to be signed in, and it essentially flopped, regardless of how um, how much we, we had pushed it. And I was quite concerned with that because it wasn't what I was picking up in the streets and surgeries and other stuff. But when we put round our paper petition round the local shops, it's, it's through the roof, it really is. So my, I suppose my question is, are RBS exploiting a particular demographic that maybe aren't protesting in the way that, that others are now, like you, you see online petitions all the time? Yeah, they're, 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 they're stretching the truth um, to some extent. Um, can I just pick up on a point that was earlier, really well, it's in my, in my head, about um, shared banking. There needs to be a change in legislation in regards to, of, to the shared banking um, uh, opportunity. Um, just coming back to your point, yet yeah, um, RBS are kind of stretching the truth somewhat. Um, clearly, there is um, a feeling out there about when the, the last potentially around the last bank of town as well closing um, that, that people are angry, communities are angry. Um, what RBS, but RBS will will plow on the, with this regardless. Keith Driver. Uh, yeah, just on the point you're making about paper versus online surveys. Um, I think uh, our stats and Ofcom stats saying there's still a stubborn kind of fifth of the population that aren't online, so you're, you're missing them entirely, and yep. those are the people that are going to be most affected. Um, we tend to do paper surveys to try to capture the, the hard to reach slash easy to ignore consumers, so it is very important that um, you know, they're not brushed under the carpet, they're not missed out, and that um, you know they are reached out to to see what their experiences are. are. Um. Just a, a quick question, perhaps, to Lynn Turner before we come on to Colin Beattie. Um, you mentioned regulations about shared banking. Now, we've just had the report from the Westminster Committee. Um, do, do you want to make any comment about the recommendations it makes and whether they go far enough in particular on that point? Um, around the access to banking, I think there needs to be a statutory implementation with regards to that, because the statutory regulation, um, because banks self-regulating what happened back in 2008. Um, so I think that there needs to be some teeth in respect of that. Um, clearly the report says that, the, that they did not need to really shut these branches. There are issues around the 10 remaining branches, which is a political um, posturing, if you want, then by, um, 
by RBS and politicians because there's no criteria set about how these branches will, will remain open. There has been, a, there may have been now someone appointed, an organisation appointed to um, do this kind of review, but I um, have, will not be surprised towards the end of this year if these 10 branches close. Um, obviously, it was news to me on a, on a Sunday um, morning when a, 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 an MP um, hit the airwaves saying that he has saved 10 branches. That was quite... Um, ov obviously, um, I was straight on the phone to RBS because they are meant to consult with Unite, mm -hmm. not politicians. These are jobs but, at the end of the day. Uh, but coming back to the question of, sort of the structure and how things move forward, um, are, are there other things you would have liked to have seen proposed in terms of regulation? Uh, from the, the Westminster Committee report, are you satisfied with the conclusions it drew and recommendations? I, well, I'm, 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 I'm content with some of the, with the stuff that's came out of the of the of the Scottish Affairs Select Committee's report. Yeah, but I just think, with regards to the access to banking and consulting and, and impact assessments that you viewed today, they don't go far enough. And I think, while banks in general will hide behind a commercial sensitive. Um, position. I think there's an opportunity for to learn lessons from this, and banks should consult before they make decisions. When 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 RBS come to me to say that we're going to be shutting so many branches, they don't do that the night before. They, you know, there's a, a six to nine month lead up to that. You know, there's an opportunity for them to come to me and say, right, this is what we're going to do, and consult in a pro in a proper manner. They don't do that because of obviously the high behind the commercial sensitive. Um, issues. All right. We'll come now to questions from Colin Beattie. Thank you, Convener. I guess one of the main arguments uh, for banks closing is that they're, from the bank's perspective, they're no longer economic, and uh, that this is a classic uh, case of market failure. Can the private sector deal with that market failure? In other words, if there is demand, surely supply will move in behind that in the form of maybe other banks, credit unions, post office, a mix of other bodies. How realistic is that? Cliff? It's not realistic in the short term. Um, it could work, um, but it does require quite a bit of work behind the scenes. The post office can provide some services, but I'm told not enough and not extensive enough. The credit unions are small and they, again, are having difficulties in expanding in a way that would fill the gap. There have been too many closures for the, well, I'd like to call them community banks rather than credit unions. The trouble with credit union in an area like Juniper Green, Belerno, Curry, is it, it doesn't have the right sort of feel to it. But we have been working with Castle Community Bank and they have performed very well on the east of Edinburgh. And I think you're meeting with uh, their general manager next week, so you'll find out a lot more about what their plans are. We're working with them. They have promised to provide a mobile van service into uh, the, va the villages of the upper water of Leith to, to fill the gap. But it will only be part of a solution. But it needs a lot more help and a lot more help from people like yourselves. Does anyone else have a comment on that? Uh, Keith Driver. Mm. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, just a, on a, a few of those things that you mentioned, um, you mentioned about the private sector deal with the market failure. Uh, I think maybe it's the the uh, bank itself that has failed to provide the service in the way that the community needs. Uh, and actually, rather than reducing hours, they should actually be looking at when people need banking services and then people would come and, and access the services. So maybe actually they need to adjust rather than close. Um, in terms of post offices, um, certainly they're a viable alternative for some. They, um, I think every bank in the UK has an agreement with the post office to provide uh, banking services through them, um, but it depends on whether you can access the post office, and we know there are thousands fewer than there were back in 2010, so there's an issue there, um, and that post offices aren't available as they used to be, so some people can't access banks or post offices. In terms of um, small businesses, um, we we did a survey and found that small businesses in rural areas were twice as likely to use banking services 
in post offices than they are in urban areas. So there is that demand for it, but it can't cater for all businesses. It's not like for like, um, they have limits on the amount of trans, um, amount of deposits and the amount of uh, cash you can get out. So for larger small businesses, it actually doesn't work for them. So uh, post offices can work for some, but not for all. It's not a like for like replacement because not everybody can access it and it doesn't provide every service um, that consumers or um, businesses require. Are post offices the only short-term viable alternative at present? Um, I would say so. Um, clearly there are issues with regards to mobile vans, um, access with dis disability access. You know, there's, there's the people are doing transactions on, in, in the middle of a car park. Um, you know, there's security issues around, around mobile vans as well. So, but saying that, you know, if branches are queued out the door or post offices are queued out the door and people have large amounts of money, there's security issues all around. Alistair McCullough. Thank you. Uh, what I was really wanting to say is that I think banks are being very short-sighted. Uh, as my colleague at the end there said, that, that they should be thinking more out of the box. A bank, uh, the, the branch network as it stands uh, is not perfect. But surely what they could have done is actually look at that and offer a smaller bank, uh, reduced hours, uh, combine it. I mean, for example, as community council, I would love to have been able to buy or been able to somehow get fund to buy the Bank of Scotland branch and use it as a community hub, which would have a bank in it uh, so that we could use that for many, many more purposes, not just a bank and uh, not just a branch. Uh, and I think that's the really way to go for, for in the, the small rural areas, uh, almost like the, the way the post office is, uh, to survive in the rural areas, post offices are everything. You know, they sell, <laughs> so you name it, they sell it probably. So in a, in a slightly different model, I think uh, if the banks looked at that and, and had a small area within, like they do in supermarkets and things like that. So you could have, the building could be multi-purpose but the branch would, would tag on to that, so the expenses would be shared, but the building itself would be far more useful to the community, and I think the bank would get credit for that. It, you, you, you know, it's not rocket science. In, in, in the old days, when I'm, I'm a banker for 35 years, uh, finished as a senior manager of the Bank of Scotland, but we had what were called sub-offices, which were incredibly popular. And, and we had them in all sorts of places which would not be financially viable. We had them in large factories. We had them in uh, uh, schools. Uh, and that worked very, very well. And the, the cost of that was very small, but it engaged the communities that they served. So the, the sub-branch became a, a very important asset for, for the communities that we served. And I don't understand why why we've sort of we've stopped doing that. We, we've become very rigid in what what people what the banks think branches are, and what the customers actually expect the branches to be. And there's this huge disconnect. Uh, and as I said earlier, the the, the banks' knee-jerk reaction to that is to close them. They don't want to think about how they could use them in other ways, how they could could be a, a, an asset. They just want to close them and just move on. Uh, and you know, you can only, when you talk about, you know, moving with your, you know, your feet, voting with your feet, you can only do that when there's a branch to go to. You know, when there's no branches to go to, where you go, you know, and the post office is, is totally impractical. As, as, as a banker, I mean, the post offices are simply not set up to, to be banks because they're not banks. A bank is a bank for a reason. And the services that they, they, they provide are not what post offices are, are set up for. So in a short-term solution, absolutely post offices. But let's let's have a bit of imagination and, 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 and think out the box and make branches far more, far more multi-purpose. And Paul Alexander. Just to support Alistair there, uh, there's certainly evidence down south where there's some regional building societies that have done uh, creative things such as uh, a local library uh, was due to close through lack of funding and uh, Newcastle Building Society took it over and paid for the, the library to keep running and opened a branch in there. So there is there are ways around it um, with a bit of creative thinking. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Cliff. 
Yeah, one, one slight problem in our area now is that the banks have sold all those buildings that could have been used uh, for the kind of activities that Alistair was talking about, community use. I mean, in Juniper Green, we have very few public buildings, and it would have been great to have the RBS building uh, and use that as a community hub for banking and for other purposes, because it's a big enough building to do all sorts of things. The post office isn't the solution, but it can be part of the solution. Credit unions aren't the solution, but could be part of the solution. But they do need a lot of support behind the scenes to help that happen. We probably have about 20 years to phase this through so that all our older people can move on and we'll come to dying at some stage. <laughs> On that cheery note, <laughs> 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 leave, leaving, aside, leaving aside the rights and wrongs of branch closures, coming back to the point that we've heard from retailers that there's a, there's a huge demand for local bank branches. We hear from individuals, community councils, all sorts of bodies that there's this huge demand. Why isn't somebody moving into that space? Why isn't that happening? Maybe one of the challenger banks or whatever. Why isn't somebody recognising this? <laughs> a bank isn't a supermarket. It's not a shop. Uh, there, there is legalities involved. There is, there is security involved. It's not as simple as that. Uh, and a lot of the, the smaller banks are very much uh, area-based. So they find it very, very difficult to expand to other, other areas without the, the guarantee of X amount of customers. So it's really not, not as simple. You're, really, you're not comparing like with like, I would, I would suggest. Uh, I think it takes a, 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 it takes a big company uh, to actually step in. And, and these the small building societies and the community banks really aren't, aren't, they aren't in, they're too young to, to, to do that at the moment. Certainly, maybe in, in, in 20 years when we're audited, uh, we, we, we will have that. And I mean, I mean, I mean the, the banks are obviously just, I mean, it sounds horrible, but they have basically just, the, the, the older population have just ignored and said, well, they're going to die anyway. So, you know, we don't have to spend much t much time on them. And that that is really the cynical view, I think, that they're, that they're taking. Uh, but as I say, I don't think that the smaller banks are really f fit to do that at, at the moment. They're too young. Cliff again. Yeah, well, what, one bank that looked as though it might be the sort of thing that would help in a community is the Metro Bank. But it's it's uh, really around London, I think. It hasn't expanded further further north yet. Uh, but it did look as though it had the right kind of attitude for today's world of dealing with not only the young but the old. And we, 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 we shouldn't forget the young, by the way, in this. A number of people in our public meetings said to us, you know, we like to take our children to the bank and put money in to show them that this is how you save money. And we've lost that in our communities because the, the, there aren't places for them to go now. I know the banks are doing things like going to the schools, but to some extent that's a disconnect for kids because they don't see something that's theirs. It's, it's, it's an exercise that they're having at school. But we mustn't forget the young in this. It's all part of the same thing in communities. And I mm. mentioned dying, by the way, because when... <laughs> When somebody dies in the family and you have to go and do, deal with the bank over changing the bank account, you have to go to the bank at their convenience, not yours, and it's a very difficult time for, pe for families when, when they've lost someone. And, and that can be a, a, an issue. And that brings us right back to what's missing is the face-to-face -face in banking. That's what we're losing in our communities. Lynn Turner. Yeah, it's just to... to um, touch on a point about if you go to a branch, you're automatically met by um, someone who will try to guide you to um, a, a machine where you don't need to speak to a, a, a teller. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's all automated. You know, I stand in the queue. You know, what I mean, um, because I'm principled. I don't want a machine to take my my money. Um, so you know, th th there's yeah. Someone talked about. Um, uh, the, you know the bank or banks bullying people into online banking. There, there, there is a there is a real case for that. You know what I mean? I think that was exposed in the Daily Record with regards to uh, branch tellers having targets to move people onto online banking. 
Um, Paul Alexander. And yeah, I think as well for uh, somebody to step into that space is very difficult because it all comes down to cost versus the scale of the business. And I think the difference is, um, for example, ourselves, we're a very small financial institution in Scotland, 170 years old, but it's in terms of scale, very, very small. And therefore, for us to look at stepping in, the cost would be prohibitive because we wouldn't be able to give our members value through products to do that. Whereas RBS, Lloyd's, massive organisations, the, the impact in terms of cost to them is, is minimal compared to you know, a smaller organisation. So I think a lot of it is around the cost versus the scale. All right, thank you. And now Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, convener, and uh, <coughs> good morning. Uh, we've already touched upon this morning um, what the alternatives, ineffective or effective, are of um, post offices or credit unions or mobile banking units. And I'm aware that in my own constituency, uh, we have had the introduction of the mobile banking units in Balerno, uh, Curry, and Juniper Green. And I'm just wondering if the panel has a view on how effective a 30 minute slot is in a particular area. Alistair McKillop. Gordon, uh, uh, that, that's very interesting because I was speaking to two quite elderly uh, ladies uh, last week, and one of them says, uh, <laughs> it took me 30 minutes to go on the bloody bus. <laughs> because <laughs> she's, she's uh, it's not very good at walking. Uh, and to be honest, she didn't like it. She didn't like it at all. She felt, I think you raised this about security, she felt very, very vulnerable mm -hmm. in the middle of the, our, I mean, it's, it's the middle of the library, but she, st she felt very, very vulnerable in using it, and she didn't think it was long enough. She was very happy that it was there, but she just felt that it really wasn't fit for her or her sister. Uh, because, as I say, with their infirmary, they really can't get up the steps. It's really quite difficult. And uh, when they were in there, they just felt there was no privacy, uh, and um, it was it wasn't a pleasant experience. However, so they probably will not be using it again. But it's it's something that certainly the younger and more mobile uh, are, are are very happy with. But thirty minute slot, Gordy, it's it's just ridiculous. It's it's just not not enough time. Cliff. Well, it's not enough time, but it's 30 minutes that we didn't have. Um, we have worked quite hard to get something back into our communities. I mentioned the fact that you know we're losing uh, shopping, we're losing uh, loan income. Uh, so to get something back uh, is worthwhile. Now, my experience of the use in Juniper Green has been that businesses, instead of having to send a couple of guys into town with the takings, are able to use the <coughs> van. Uh, another business was able to get checks in, uh, which were taking him to drive into town. So that's another aspect of, um, you know, the use of transport that is uh, another knock-on from the bank closures. The school are using it on a regular basis, and they've said to me, you know, it's saving us two hours uh, in going into town to do the banking they have to do. I don't know what they have to do, but it's saving them time. And there's been at least 10, 15 or so people using it fairly regularly, older people. Um, I managed to get up and down the steps okay. I can see that that's an issue, and it doesn't cater for the wheelchair uh, people either. They claim that that's because when they did have the lift, the wheelchair uh, folk didn't use it. Lloyd's Bank, as I understand it, do have uh, a, a wheelchair lift. We have made contact with um, a lady from the Royal Society, uh, what's it called, the Royal School of Art in London, who's doing a research project for Age UK in looking at uh, banking for the future for elderly people and disabled people. She's looking at Dartmouth, uh, Liverpool, London and Edinburgh and we're running a workshop uh, on the 19th of June for volunteers who can come and tell their story so we can try and get the ladies that had trouble getting on the, 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 uh, the van in Curry to come along to that so that they can tell their story. She's a designer 
and we might be able to look at things that are a little bit more flexible so that maybe the sides like these uh, vans in the states uh, the rvs that you can expand the, the space so that it's more uh, well better space uh, better security and things like that so th those are issues that we're, we're hoping to look at from uh, at this perspective 30 minutes isn't enough and i've been promised when uh, the community bank come they will spend a morning in each of our communities so that's uh, something to look forward to and i think a lot of people will embrace that um from what i've heard uh, that they're, they're still asking me when is that community bank coming so any way to accelerate their uh, limited services would be appreciated just just on that point um cliff about the uh, castle community bank coming yep. in do you think that's the reason why RBS put their mobile banking units in in the first place? Because they originally refused to do so. I asked that question, <laughs> and, and the answer is yes. <laughs> just just, just um, quickly, um, the RBS Managing Director of Personal Banking in Scotland said in September 2016, where a service is consistently used by fewer than 10 customers, we will review the sustainability of that branch stop. Do you think you know this has basically been set up to fail with only being 30 minute stops the cynics in our community are telling me that uh, this is there and if you don't use it it'll go um, that's why we're encouraging people to use it we've advertised it as you know in cmb and 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 with posters and as far as we're concerned we've been turning up each time as a community council to the van to make sure that things go smoothly. We're actually talking to um, someone from RBS so that we can iron out any issues. I'd like to think, and I tend to be a bit of an optimist in these matters, that RBS are in listening mode. Okay. And Maybe. Keith, I think Keith Driver wanted to come uh, in. <coughs> Yeah, I was just gonna come in on the sort of precarious nature of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a fixed bank is is much more you know, fixed or a consumer than something that comes in once a week and as happened last month, they changed the routes. So some people aren't on the route anymore, so suddenly they have no bank again. Um, so it can it can certainly help. Uh, as you, Cliff was mentioning, 30 minutes is better than nothing. But um, I think the other point I wanted to make is that it has to be built around the community, not around the bank's needs. Yeah. It has to be there at the right time and for the right amount of time. So it, it meets the needs of the community, not because it's on the right stop on yeah. the route. Yeah. It has to actually meet the, the needs of that community and each community needs to be separately assessed for its need. Right. Um, my last question relates to ATMs. Um, we're in a position where we've lost the banks, the post offices can't cope, mobile banking units are only there for 30 minutes. What about access to ATMs? I mean, what's happened over the piece in in various communities. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we lost the one when RBS left, and, and so Juniper Green, as a 5,000 inhabitant community, doesn't have an ATM or a post office. Uh, two others left from the area. Uh, when the Bank of Scotland went, they took the one in Curry, and the one in the post office in Curry went. So I think all the ones now in our area, apart from the one at the university, are outside. And again, some elderly people find that a little daunting on the security issue. Can, can I just say something too about the, um, the community bank, uh, which is that we, we want this other service to come in, but in our area, and I think you're alluding to it, I think it, it was John who was saying, why aren't other groups coming in? In areas like Belerno, Curry, Juniper Green, Collington, it's perceived that we're an affluent society and therefore the banks won't make money in those areas. People have got their mortgages, although there are young people coming in all the time. But cheek by jowl with those communities are other communities that are not so well off. And I think if we could get the community bank to have a permanent residence in one of those areas a little bit like you heard at your last hearing that in preston pans uh, capital credit union have opened up their office there and uh, that's working 
for them, I think we could try and work something for Castle Community Bank that would work. They provide a, a service, a face-to-face -face service, for what is perceived to be the affluent areas, but maybe have a permanent presence in our less affluent areas and see if we can get rid of some of these exorbitant HP uh, shops that are, uh, are also in our uh, nearby communities. Absolutely. And again, I think you could help in that process. I think you're in a position to do that. And I think almost everyone would like to come in. So perhaps Lynn Turner, then Alistair, and then Keith Drybrow. Um, there is uncertainty about the ATM network. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm on a, I've, I have a, a report. Yeah. Industry body warns of cash deserts if an ATM funding row is not resolved. Some 8,000 machines in total could be removed. You know, so you're shutting branches. Post office are struggling to, to, to um, cope, and you're also redu potentially re reductions of, of of ATMs. You know, where do p people get? You know, 68 percent. Um, there is still 68 percent cash mm. out there in circulation. You know, I mean, we're not a cashless society. Mm. We need ATMs. And can I just go back on a, onto a point about the the uh, mobile vans? Um, from from Unite's point of view, mm. security is an issue. Time slots are, are an issue, the, re the reductions of, of time slots, no disability access, um, adverse weather, uh, and uh, I think as well it's, it's the privacy of it. People want to speak to, to, to the bank about when they do the big things in life, or, or if so, unfortunately someone has passed away in a family, you, you need to wait for the van to come and have a discussion in front of everyone with, with a, a teller from a van about where do I go, what do I do with someone's estate, I think. You know, I mean, we, 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 that's just totally wrong. And I think I was listening to the chief executive of Bank of America, who was having a conversation about their branch network. He currently has 4,500 branches across America. He says it is 30% online, 70% face-to-face. People in life want to speak to people when they do the big things. And that just speaks for itself, yeah. which is totally opposite to what RBS is saying, 70%. Face-to-face, um, 30% uh, uh, face-to-face, 70% online. Um, Alistair McKillop. Uh, just really briefly f uh, to respond to Gordon, the, the other ATM that we have is beside the doctor surgery, mm -hmm. and it's totally inaccessible to those who are disabled. Totally inaccessible. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's your answer there as well. There's, there's no consideration for, for those living in isolation who are disabled. That's all. Uh, Keith Drybrow. Uh, I think the bank closes are a double, double whammy for consumers in that they're losing that local support and advice, but the, the ATM has been removed is, is just as bad for some people. Um, there's lots of examples of um, you know, towns and villages that have lost their bank, but the ATM, the only ATM might be in the shop. Um, and then there's issues around the opening times of the shop. And if the shop closes, then what happens? Then people lose access to cash completely. Um, as we mentioned, the security issues around accessing cash in the shop as well. Um, and uh, I think I, I worry that in what we mentioned about the, the problems with Link and the potential closure of, of um, sort of privately run ATMs, particularly in sort of rural areas, I wonder if we're going to be here in a year or two years' time talking just about ATMs. And I think bank closures are part of that. And I think when we talk about banks, we have to think about banks, ATMs, and post offices all in one, almost. And that That is people's access to cash and access to financial services. And I think all of them are under threats. Um, so I think ATMs is, is, is really important for consumers, and it's almost a, a, a disaster waiting to happen if, if things don't pan out as, as we hope. Okay, thanks very much. And now Fulton McGregor. Uh, I'd mentioned in my uh, earlier supplementary about the Steps Bank in my constituency, and um, uh, it's referred to as the last bank in town, which I've actually got a real gripe with because it's actually the last bank for about five or six towns. So instead of... Um, closing it down as the last bank in town scenario. I think they should have been expanding to other areas. And I, I picked up on what Cliff had said as well about, um, you know, what area has been seen as affluent or in steps in my constituency so could probably be seen as quite affluent, but Moody's Burn, for example, certainly isn't. So that was just a point there. I, I mean, there's, my, my questions are around uh, the community council taking ownership of banks, and, and I think we've, we've kind of covered that, so I won't, um, won't get people to labour the point. But what I'm interested in is, do you think there's scope for if a bank is seen as the last bank in town, with that caveat that I've said there, you know, they could be covering a few towns, um, that there should really be something in place where the building or the premises is 
offered uh, as a first point is offered to uh, any viable community alternative. Alice, Alice, sir. We contacted <coughs> the Bank of Scotland immediately after uh, uh, that we knew they were closing, uh, and it was just a flat no. It was just it's a commercial enterprise. They wouldn't be willing to. It's open market. If you can get the money, we'll sell it to you. But there was no consideration. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the sad thing is we had legislation and, and agreements with banks that there would always be. You know, the last branch in town would would stay, be saved. Since that went, uh, it's just been an open door for banks to close. And again, it's just commercial. They're, they're wanting to squeeze as much money out as possible. If the Bank of Scotland had uh, offered or, or in some way to, for us to have that building, I'm sure uh, Cliff would agree if the Royal Bank and Juniper Green had said that, we would have grabbed it with both hands and made it work because it is our community and we would be engaging in it. And there was so much we could have done uh, and in fact, I could, we could do with the uh, with with the the, the bank in, in uh, Curry. You know, as I say, it was a community hub. We could use it for almost everything. And, and we, like uh, Cliff, have got very few uh, facilities that we can use for for communities. So yes, I would love to see something like that. Absolutely, absolutely, undoubtedly, it would be, a, and it would be a great thing for the bank. Great publicity, but yeah, that's another story. Um, Cliff and then Keith yeah, Driver. Unfortunately, I feel in our communities, the horse has gone. Um, but somebody made a, a, an interesting suggestion, which uh, let me put to this group and see what, what, what you think about it. Why not a punitive tax on the banks when they sell their buildings of somewhere in the region of 50% of sale price, which you could use then uh, either to help the specific community or have it in a pot that could be used for people to bid for, for community use. Maybe that's a power you already have. Mm, don't think so. uh, Keith Driver. Um, I'm just looking at a um, press release from February from the Royal Bank that suggests that they will uh, work with local communities to uh, hand over uh, buildings um, to development trust in local communities. Uh, the important bit is that they said where there is no demand for a building, they'll do that. Um, but I don't know how they, they measure that. Um, but I think we should take them up on that and say, well, actually, you should just be doing that anyway, uh, regardless of demands. Uh, I know there's at least one of our bureau who is saying, who, who has worked with them and, and is working to try to develop a kind of a advice hub in a remote area where advice and services isn't currently provided um, easily. So they're, they're trying to take RBS up on that offer. But actually, I think we should be pressing RBS just to, if, if they are going to close it, then they should be talking to the community groups. And it's a shame that this has already happened, but um, they should be, that should be their first point. They should be looking to give it to the community rather than sell it. I think Cliff wanted to come back. But it would have been sensible for them simply to rent it to communities because then at least it would be used. The Bank of Scotland uh, building in Curry hasn't been used. The Royal Bank of Scotland uh, building in, in Juniper Green hasn't been used. But communities would find a use for them. And they're just derelict at the minute and they're an eyesore to the communities. Lynn Turner. Costa seems to be the winner at, at the moment with X branches. Yeah. I don't know if there's some sort of deal being done there. Hmm. Uh, Keith Driver. Just to come in. I think there is a role for local government and potentially national government to actually support community groups to make it viable for them to take over buildings. Uh, I know the example I know of the local authority is involved and that actually is helping the process a lot to, to have um, you know government involved in supporting it. So, so picking up on that point, is that something you think that local government it should be doing as standard um, when a when a branch is yeah. due or nominated for closure. I, I'm not sure as, as standard, but I think they should certainly be involved and in, in looking at what can be done. Uh, and I definitely think there is a role um, that they can have. And understand local authorities are under pressure with their budgets oh. and so on. But I think it can take a lot of, lot of boxes for local authorities as well. Mm -hmm. So we'd certainly be encouraging them to be involved in that process. Alistair. Thank you, God. It's just really, they should be forced to engage with the communities that they, they have served for many, many years and their loyal customers, as I say, over 30 years. I think you're absolutely right, sticky customers. That's how banks have made massive profits throughout the decades is because customers, no matter, through thick and thin, will stay with the bank. They don't know. So, yes, I, I, I think we have to stop this, this ridiculous charade 
of the banks saying that they have engaged with their communities when it's patently obvious that they haven't. And uh, I think we need your help to make them do that properly. So, uh, for, for example, if a bank is, is due for closure, then um, that sort of sparks a, a chain of events where the local authority would then call a meeting and the bank would have to it attend. It sparks debate, absolutely. And then brings members, community councils, whoever else, other stakeholders together. Exactly. Um, at the start of that process. Yes, at the start is the key. Okay. Absolutely. Lynn Turner. But the start has been nine or six or nine months ago. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. I get presented with a business case from RBS to say we're going to be shut in. In fact, the business case with these 62 branches from, from Scotland was actually a, 168 branches were cut in throughout the UK. And therefore, there is very little I can, as a trade union officer, to mitigate what is in that business case because the work has already been done. So, you know, consulting with the trade union is difficult for them. What are they going to do with the Joe public? You know what I mean? That, that, that's the issue. So are you saying there should be a duty on the banks to consult before they take a decision to close a branch? Well, that would be consultation, wouldn't it? You know, and, um, yes. Well, I'm thinking in terms of the current banking protocol would have to be changed to require... Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And, and, and clearly, that's what I said earlier on, there needs to be you know, a statutory regulation with regards to um, consultation for bank, bank branch closures. Access to banking protocol is not worth the paper it's written on. Um, did Keith Driver want to come? Uh, yes, it is. Um, I partly forgotten. Uh, sorry, uh, it was just um, the ten uh, banks that there is going to be um, that independent review of um, over the summer that have had a state of execution. I think that marks an, uh, a small window of opportunity to do things much better. Um, and at the moment, it's very opaque and unclear how they're going to do the independent review. But if they want to consult with consumers, if they want with, to work with community groups uh, and do it properly, th this represents an opportunity. Uh, and I think it takes, um, you know, committees and governments to to make, you know, to tell them that message and make sure that it actually happens. Um, and that there's potential to to do things better in, in through those ten. And perhaps it's an opportunity to demonstrate how it could could operate. Yeah. Um, and now Jackie Bailey. Yeah, I am perhaps more cynical than, than Keith Driver is, because um, we've had the access to banking protocol in 2015, we then had the access to banking standards in 2017, and yet we're still closing bank branches. So, so let me turn this on its head and let me, let me say at the start, I am an absolute fan of credit unions, but we're talking about mitigating something where actually perhaps we should be further upstream, Lynn Turner's point, about how we get in amongst the, the detail before these decisions are made. Um, so let me explore a bit of that with you, because I think Unite Submission challenged us to say, you know, why are we talking about mitigation? Surely we would be resisting closure. So if you were to design a system that resisted closure, um, or you wanted to see recommendations coming from this committee, what would they be? Your top two or three? Early consultation. Okay. Um, open desks and transparency. Um, and honesty. Would you require, would you, give, given that, that these are all valuable sentiments and I couldn't agree more, would you require legislation that actually meant they had to do it? Yes. And it's not a cosy Abs little, absolutely, you know, because we all agree. Clearly, you know, uh, they've not consulted with communities. They've they've consulted with the Un Unite um, in the words of consulting. Um, there's a word meaningful um, missing in that process. As I said, when, when they present a business case to us, there is very little I can actually mitigate in, in regards to that. All the stats are done. You know, there's timetables, uh, you know, of closure process. There's maps given to me you know, how many f people footfall, all that kind of stuff is given to me. So I get this huge pile of information, but I can't do anything with it. Is, is there an issue for us before anybody else comes in about um, making sure that there is an agreed framework about what they measure? Because I'm surprised at your description of if you don't have a an account in that branch, and, you know, my just thinking, my, my own branch account is where I lived 20 years ago. 
not the branch I used just now. That means I don't count. You don't. It's extraordinary. Okay, so a legislative framework that, that would include measures that actually specified what you measure, what the criteria are, would that be yes. what you were looking yeah. for? Yeah, Okay. Um, the, the impact on communities, it's not just the, the, the branch, that there's a, there's a huge impact which is totally ignored by banks at the moment, uh, of the, the impact of, of not having any banks or branches in a 10, 15 mile radius. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the community itself, and that is totally uh, ignored at the moment. Yeah, we we heard some uh, um, some discussion previously about impact on businesses, impact on communities. Um, would you also go so far as to say that you would have a requirement or make a requirement on the banks collectively to have at least one branch left in town? That's going back to when it used to be yes, and that worked very well. The banks didn't like it. Uh, because they tended to, to feel that they were being piggy in the middle and being stuck in a, bra a place that they didn't want it to be, but the communities respected it and used the banks as much as they could. So, absolutely, yeah. But, I mean, as I said, it, it has to be from day one. It cannot be six, seven, eight, nine months down the line. True engagement means that you're engaged from the beginning with your communities, with the union, uh, but that, that simply does not happen at the moment. So we need legislation to force the banks into doing that. Okay. And I'm sorry, Lynn yeah. Turner. Um, it's also about the viability of the local post office then, because um, I, f I forget what um, area it was, but you know the, the RBS are pinpointing or showing people the, the post office but the post office is actually up for sale. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so they're not being exactly truthful with regards to the post office. Sure, I've, I've direct experience of that locally, not just with the post office, but promise of a mobile unit that a year later has still not transpired. Um, I wonder whether I could just be cheeky enough to ask one last question. I think the RBS AGM t is today, convener. I certainly heard it on tomorrow. the radio. Tomorrow. tomorrow. There yes. you go. I'm a day in advance, so it's tomorrow. Um, I just checked. Government ownership of ordinary shares is 71%. Institutional ownership is 55%. What message, if you were the government, would you convey to RBS? <laughs> <laughs> Open goal for you. Um, well, they've done very little so far, haven't they? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and tomorrow's AGM, where, where Unite will be demonstrating outside the AGM, um, you know, a, a, a message to ordinary shareholders that this, they've got this totally wrong. Um, there's, there's an arrogance about this because also because while they were um, discussing um, the branch closures in Scotland with the Scottish Affairs Select Committee, lo and behold, they announced a further 162 branches to close in England and Wales of the Williams and Glen um, organisation. You know, why put yourself through that pain? Um, but there's an arrogance about they are going to shut branches and they do not listen. Well, we'll come to questions from Julian Martin. Thank you, convener. And Jackie Bailey's line of question has led very nicely on to mine, and it is about what governments can do. And a few, I mean, we've already covered quite a few things. I think that you've... Um, your asks of legislation. Um, and I'm sitting here with, I'm looking on my phone at the access to banking commitment. And I think you're absolutely right. There's nothing there that says that they have, they don't make any um, attempts to even say that they will consult before it's all about what they will do after they've made a decision to close. So again, a nice open goal for you. What do you think Given that, of course, um, issues around banking regulation are reserved to the UK government, they could do to stop this situation from happening where uh, towns and communities will be left without a last bank in town. And in this particular reference to RBS, which of course, is, as Ms Bailey's already said, um, are majority shareholded by the government. Well, it, I mean, it's almost too late for our communities because what, what I mentioned earlier was a cooperation, at least a chat, to say, well, the Bank of Scotland's closed, RBS is now the only bank on the A70. Let's keep that one and maybe we shut Castolfan. I don't know why six banks find 
a, a, a home on the A8 and none on the A70. Is geography not part of the, cons uh, the, the um, curriculum anymore? Tongue in cheek, uh, Chairman. That's all right. Um, so you're saying that you, you, you'd like to see in, in regulations an, a, an acknowledgement of a geographical area yeah. and, and, yeah. The, and the, the, if, a, a, if, if the area, whatever the parameters are of that is, there is a last bank for that community, much like Fulton McGregor has mentioned, that there's some kind of statutory yes. obligations on the, the remaining bank? Yeah, I mean, it's clear in the towns where there's only one bank left. In, in the city, then they have to look at transport routes, so that uh, a bus route from Belerno, Curry, Juniper Green, Collington, those kind of things would make sense, that you keep a branch that can serve 20,000 people. It's effectively a small town that is now lost its banking uh, opportunities. And it's that face-to-face -face bit. You go right back to the beginning when we said who affected the elderly, the disabled, the people who can't go online, or won't go online. And we haven't talked about those either. The, the, the TSB situation hasn't helped, and all the big banks have actually got to go through that same process that TSB are still going through. So we ain't seen nothing yet, I am told. Uh, Alistair. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you. Um, I think it is all about, uh, at the moment, the, the feeling I have uh, is that there's a spreadsheet somewhere with numbers on it, and rather than look at uh, the impact on communities, they look at the top 100 branches who are not making money, and it's just somebody says, we'll just close them. There is no, well, there's no apparent uh, observations that they're not looking, that they are looking at communities and the impact, which is why I think it's very important that, that the community impact is to the fore when they're deciding to close branches. And as I said before, the banks are quite happily ignoring that at the moment and they will close. And you get to the ridiculous situation, as Cliff says, that there are six banks in one area and there is zero in another. So it is, it is, there's no logic in how they do it. And I think we need to, we need to give them a little push and, and, and educate them in how they should be doing this. And I think we need government uh, to help us with that. And Keith Driver. Uh, I was noticing in the Scottish Rural Action Submission, they suggested a universal service obligation on banking, much like the Royal Mail have, whereby banks cannot close the last bank or ATM in town. Uh, I mean, that, that was agreed by banks uh, a number of years ago, but um, they seem yeah. to have reneged 2010, I think, that Royal Bank actually made a statement saying they would never close the last bank account. Am I, am I correct? Yeah. Most yeah. Of the year, yeah. Yeah, so it's you know, something along those lines cer certainly have sympathy on. Uh, as we mentioned before, the fact that consumers have no um, stake in this whatsoever, apart from the fact that they get notice. I mean, that's about it, and they get some mm -hmm. information that may or may not be right. Mm -hmm. um, consumers should be sh and customers should be central central to this. I mean, it's the service is provided for them, um, and without them, the service wouldn't be there. So actually, they need to be central to this. Uh, how you do that, I'm not sure, but certainly having a uh, consultation much, much earlier before decision being taken is certainly a first step. And I'm quite taken by what Alice just said about imagination. Um, banks are showing little imagination in terms of um, how they can do things differently. I'm not sure you can compel imagination, but certainly they need um, a little bit of a push in the, in the direction of uh, being a bit more imaginative about, about meeting customers' needs rather than assuming customers don't want their services because they're not coming think actually we're, we're not serving customers, how, how can we serve customers better and how can we integrate in communities better? That makes business sense but also meets the needs of our consumers. And Lynn Turner. I think there's an opportunity with regards to the UK government setting the tone for this. Um, clearly um, they've stepped back from that saying that this is a commercial decision but being 70% owned by the British taxpayer they had an opportunity to kind of set the tone. And I think we've not touched on, and Cliff's absolutely right, you know, IT failure. What happens if there is a outage again like RBS had a few years ago, or indeed more recently TSB, where people can't, you know, pay for things at the counter with their credit card or debit card, take money out of an ATM? You know, that's when, that's when you need a branch, and that's when it will kick in with regards to these branches. And if you live in Castlebay, 
you know, you need a, it's a seven hour round trip, you know what I mean, and a ferry to get to the next RBS branch. So, you know, they've, uh, they've not looked at that. They, they will, as Cliff's read, there will be failure somewhere in, I, in the IT system, whatever bank there is. You know, if people can hack into the NHS, it'll not be long before they can start hacking into the banks. There, I mean, obviously, the, the, a, a couple of years ago, the, um, there were changes in regulations to banks about separating the commercial arm of the bank with the, the high street bank. Um, so changes can be done by government to, to regulation. Do you think we've got to the point where there's it's like a, a watershed moment that well, the UK well, government has to step in? Well, to be fair, from investment banks to retail banking, you know, that, the ring fence banks, that's, that's all moving along um, this year with regards to that. Um, so, you know, the banks will come out and announce that, I have no doubt, soon because there's, there's discussions about that. Mm. Um, so we, we wait for, for what, what comes out of the ring fence banks. But... Absolutely. That's just say one. Yeah. 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 Just, just as the bank. I mean, the, the the government had an opportunity in 2015, I think it was, to actually vote in legislation as we were discussing, and it failed. So, why it failed is a, is a, is another question. And I know that uh, uh, Vince Vince Cable was was very much for it, but the, but it failed. So. We have tried once, and I, I think we should certainly try again. But as I say, we did have the opportunity in 2015, 2016, to, 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 to bring this into fruition. But with 71% ownership of the Royal Bank of Scotland, is, is it not the tail wagging the dog? It's, it is, it's, it's beyond my comprehension why the government hasn't done something about this already. Um, right. Uh, well, just on that last point, um, is it... Correct. The, the Westminster report doesn't recommend or set out any specific recommendations for legislation of the type you've just been talking about. It doesn't. So it's not just the UK government. The, the select committee hasn't suggested that either. For their 71% to be sold off, and that's why they are not wishing to rock that particular boat. You're referring to the cross-party committee or the government or both? The government. The government. Well, the, the, the company that owns the 71% of these shares, it, it's a kind of hands-off uh, hands um, arrangement as I understand it. Lynn Turner. And then we come to final questions from Jamie Halcourt johnson um, the report, uh, Chair, suggests that obviously it's disappointing that UK government minister, no government uh, UK minister appeared to respond to the questions. So yes, I, I see that, but I was asking specifically what recommendations the committee had given as to legislation, which was what we're talking about. No, there's nothing in, in, in respect to the report. No, thank you, thank you. Uh, Jamie Halcourt Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Welcome to the panel today. Um, the area that I represent, Highlands and Islands, obviously there's been a number of closures across across the region, and um, uh, and I'm very aware of the impact that's had on <coughs> quite a lot of small communities, uh, many of the remote communities there. So, can I ask a question? But can I ask it as a almost as a devil's advocate because it's um, um, as I say, I, I'm from, I live on Orkney, and we very much value our local banks and the ability to to access them. Um, there is an argument that, that um, the generation that perhaps is, uh, the particularly older generation now, um, that is not tech savvy, um, hasn't been brought up with uh, computers and accessing online, um, the gener that generation in, say, 20 years' time or, um, will be more tech savvy, will have more experience. Um, there will be new ways of accessing online that, which make it easier, such as voice recognition and fingerprint technology. Do you think these cuts if they came about in uh, these closures came about in say 10 15 years time would they have less impact than they perhaps have now yes so, you're missing you're missing something that's very very important you're missing the face to face transactions which people like so not i mean Again, it's just part of the solution is electronic and, and voice recognition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as a banker, uh, you know, of, as I say, of 30 odd years, there's nothing more important than sitting down with your customer 
and actually speaking to them. And uh, whether you do that by Skype or whatever, which is, I mean, another thing out the box, well, you know, they could they could have used Skype in the branches, so uh, you know, for mortgage advice, for example, so they could cut the staff like that. But as I said, don't underestimate the importance of face to face. And irrespective of if it's 20 years from now or not, I'm sure people will still like to speak to people. I recognise I recognise people doing that, and from my own personal banking preferences, that is the way I bank. But I'm just talking about uh, hypothetically. I mean, we are we there are less and less, or fewer and fewer. Sorry, kind of. Um, face-to-face -face, uh, interactions and when we shop or whatever we do or where we access services. So it was just it was just an interest there. Um, well, and, I, and I very much take the point that's been raised in terms of um, TSB in an, in an area where you, we have slow broadband and a, a whole host of different um, issues in terms of accessing online. Trust in that online uh, offering has to be, has to be uh, yeah. important too. And those living with dementia for example, will never be able to use banking, and and that's why face to face is very very important for for, for these 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 people. So as I say, it's not it's not a one fit all. You know, we have to again think out the box, and we should have why not? We can have branches, and we can have it can all live together. There's no reason why it can't, but they have to get rid of this rigid mindset that the banks have at the moment. If your branch, if if they see that the branch is not actually making a profit then they just want to close it, is very short-minded. And I think we, we have to make them recognise the, the, the impact that that can have on, on communities and work with them to, to make banks more user-friendly because a lot of people don't like using banks now because the, you go into a bank and the first thing that hits you is somebody trying to sell you something. And then you go to the teller, if there is one, uh, and they're trying to sell you something. So, you know, that's not ideal either. So I think there's, there's there's improvement in both sides. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, my last question was quite was, was fairly simple. I mean, we're seeing closures of bank branches, we're seeing closures of high street stores, we're seeing more and more business go online. Do you think we've seen the worst of this yet, or is it going to get worse over the next few years? Um, Alan Turner. I was comforted by the chief exec of RBS at the Scottish Affairs Select Committee by saying there'll be no more branch closures in Scotland until 2020. So uh, 2020 starts on the 1st of January. I have uh, no doubt they will uh, be looking for more branch closures in England and Wales. I think that currently RBS have 753 branches, 89 of which are Scottish. The rest are all um, England and Wales based. They constantly tell us that RBS serves 600 communities. You don't need to be a mathematician with regards to um, what comfortable number RBS would probably want to get down to with regards to its branch number. And how many how many branches in Scotland would you see as threatened or potentially threatened? Well, I hope there's no more, mm -hmm. um, but who, who who knows? I you know I I just hope that these ten branches get a fair wind. Criteria is set, footfall is open and transparent, mm -hmm. and they are approved. Um, that would be a good gesture for, for RBS, I think, with regards to this. Any other comments from the panel? Uh, Cliff? Yeah, just, just to say that some of those out-of-the-box ideas have been considered. I think Nationwide were running a trial in Glastonbury uh, on Skype uh, so that uh, they didn't have to have all their experts in one place. Um, and, and that seemed to me to be a model that could be used. Um, I mentioned Metro Bank as well as something that I think could be encouraged. Uh, community banks, I agree, I think is something that we ought to be pushing a lot more for both the face-to-face -face in areas where they can't make money and to help those communities where loans can get rid of some of these HP pirates that are around. So I think there are solutions there. And maybe this tax that I mentioned before on buildings might just make the banks think twice about selling and look at renting, because after all, they're getting rid of the family silver by getting rid of all these buildings, because many of these buildings are the iconic buildings in a town or in our, in our high streets. There will be things, by the way, that I haven't <coughs> been able to remember today, 
I hope I can uh, send something through to the clerk afterwards. Is that all right, Chairman? Yes, certainly. Any of our witnesses, if they wish to submit anything further in writing, uh, please do so. I think Keith Dreisberg, perhaps the last word to you then. Oh, sure. No pressure. <laughs> Um, it was actually going back to your last question. Um, I was thinking about that, about the changing generations and uh, whether in 20 years this will be less of an issue. I think that probably is true, but I think it's a sharp, sharp shock for a lot of people who aren't prepared um, for the impact of it. Um, certainly from the Citizens Advice Bureau perspective, people still want face-to-face -face advice. Um, we're demand-led. So we have 5 million people come through our website, but we still have something like 170,000 people come for us for face-to-face -face advice. So we know people still require that. And I think if the banks aren't there, then that's going to be a big demand that isn't going to go away overnight. And it isn't just the older generations. It's the, the people that live in more deprived areas who um, have sort of cost and knowledge barriers um, to using the internet, and they're going to be badly affected. And the people that digital access hasn't caught up with yet, uh, like broadband, they're going to be impacted. Um, so I think your point is right. In 20 years' time, this won't be such an issue. But, you know, today over the summer and Christmas, it's going to be a huge issue. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to all of our witnesses for coming in today. I'll now suspend the meeting and we'll move to private session.